So welcome students, faculty, administrators, and community members to the 24th Annual Student History Conference keynote address at Ball State University. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Dr. Jessica Ruther, an assistant professor in the Department of History at Ball State. I, along with Drs. Stefan, Johnson, and Alves, served as organizers for this year's conference. First of all, on behalf of the committee, I would like to congratulate all of our student participants and commend them on their fine submissions and innovative scholarship. On the theme of innovative scholarship, it is my pleasure to introduce you to this year's keynote speaker, Dr. Brett Shaddle. Dr. Shaddle joins us virtually from Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Berg, uh, Virginia, where he is professor and chair of the Department of History. Dr. Shaddle is an expert in, on East Africa and has published two books on the 20th century history of Kenya. The far reaching breadth of the subject matter of these two books is truly impressive. He's published Girl Cases, Marriage Disputes and Colonialism in Gisiland, Kenya, 1890 to 1970, and The Souls of White Folk, White Settlers in Kenya, 1900s through 1920s. Both of these works attest to the varied nature of his research interests ranging from gender and colonial law to issues of race and settler colonialism. He is also the author of more than a dozen articles and books chapters. His talk today comes from his current project on Ethiopian refugees. I have to admit, I myself have long been an admirer of Dr. Shaddle's scholarship. I rely on his first book, Girl Cases, published in 2006 in my own current research. So I was pleasantly surprised when in May 2019, I received an email from him and in his words, a fellow Africanist passing through Muncie to visit the special collections here at Ball State. To be perfectly honest, at the time, I was a little shocked. I hadn't realized that there were relevant archival collections on African topics here in Muncie. Dr. Shaddle traveled to Muncie, used the Sir Norman Agnell papers, and shared a coffee with me at the cup. I am excited to see how his project has progressed since summer 2019. Today's keynote is entitled, Their Empire, Ethiopian Refugees in the Continuity of Independent Ethiopia During Italian Occupation from 1936 to 1941. Throughout Dr. Shaddle's presentation, attendees may submit their questions in the Q&A function at any time. At the completion of his talk, I will ask Dr. Shaddle your questions and he will answer them. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shadow back in a virtual sense to Ball State. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Shadow. Great, thank you, Dr. Ruther. Um, really appreciate you. First of all, thank you for the introduction. Um, I thank you all for having me here today. Um, this is very much a work in progress. This research is going to be part of a chapter in a book that's that's growing much too big. Um, so this is ongoing research. So I really would love any kind of feedback that y'all have. Um, and you're going to see what research likes as, as it is in process rather than in a completed state. Um, I'm going to sh uh, share a PowerPoint today to give you some images. And so you don't have to stare at me the entire time. Uh, so let me share this, and I'll get started. Um, on June 3rd, 1936, Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia arrived via train in London. It was just over a month since he had left his capital, Addis Ababa. With invading Italian troops closing in, Selassie and his counselors thought discretion the better part of valor. Although the, he had already demonstrated great valor, leading his army at the front lines and suffering from a gas attack. But now it seemed wiser for him to plead his case at the League of Nations. And so he left his palace for French Somaliland, which is now Djibouti. From there, a short stay at Jerusalem, a night at Gibraltar, then landing at Southampton. 
And a supportive crowd welcomed him at the Waterloo Station, including several members of the House of Commons, the House of Lords, and leaders of pro-Ethiopian, anti-colonial, anti-fascist, and anti-war groups. Outside the train, outside the train stations, thousands cheered him holding banners with messages including, welcome to the emperor. And here he is uh, after arriving in London and then uh, um, at the Ethiopian legation, looking out at the other thousands of people who had greeted him there. A few hours before the emperor received his well wishes, a similar scene had unfolded in Italy. First in Naples, then in Rome, Pietro Bagdolio received a hero's welcome. Adoring crowds, flowers tossed upon his car, greeted at the train station by Benito Mussolini himself. For just days after Haile Selassie fled Addis Ababa, Badoglio's army entered the city. It was thanks to him that the Italian government declared sovereignty over Ethiopia and King Victor Emmanuel would be granted the new title of Emperor of Abyssinia. And Abyssinia being a common name used in Europe for Ethiopia incorrectly. And so it was on that June 3rd, 1936, a thousand miles apart, two men, Haile Selassie, Haile Selassie and Pietro Bagdolio, each were celebrated, one for defending his empire, the other for establishing a new empire. Two men, Haile Selassie and Victor Emmanuel, each were greeted as emperors over the same piece of land. Two men, Haile Selassie and Benito Mussolini, each sought international recognition for their claims of sovereignty over Ethiopia. Emperor Haile Selassie was in a desperate state. Mussolini had been planning to invade Ethiopia for years, in part to avenge the Italian defeat at the Battle of Adwa in 1896, the last time Italy had tried to invade Ethiopia. And Ethiopia's win at that time helped to secure the status of it as one of two independent states on the continent. Now, into 1934, 1935, as the possibility of war became more and more clear, the League of Nations and the most powerful nations in Europe, Britain and France, had showed themselves reluctant to help Ethiopia, which was at this time a member of the League of Nations. After the Italians invaded in October 1935, limited sanctions had been imposed on Italy, but not on oil. And uh, uh, sanctions on oil importations would have grounded his mechanized war machine to a halt. But there was very little support for that. Foreign ministers of Britain and France in December had even discussed ways secretly of appeasing Italy by dividing up Ethiopia. And so as the emperor's representatives at Geneva worked to convince the League to redouble, or perhaps even just to begin, its efforts to end the war and force an Italian retreat, the emperor and his allies undertook a public campaign to assert the continuity of Ethiopian independence and the emperor's claim to rule it. Now, much has been written, sorry, wrong time. Much has been written about the Ethiopian crisis as it was called at the time. The failures of the League was written about by scholars concerned with the history of that institution uh, written about support for Ethiopia in Africa and the Black Diaspora by scholars interested in the history of anti-colonialism and pan-Africanism. Uh, the military struggle itself by historians of Ethiopia and historians of warfare. Uh, histories of the pro-Ethiopian movements in Britain uh, done by biographers of leading figures such as Sylvia Pankhurst or scholars of political movements like the League of Nations Union. But far less attention has been given to the political and ideological efforts of the Ethiopian exiles and refugees to retain claims to their state. So today, I want to take just one part of this, primarily in uh, the months of 1936, after the emperor uh, arrived in London in exile. Um, in part, that's because where I am in my research, and in part from December 1936 and into 1937, the political and military situation had changed in Europe. So the arguments I'm making today um, apply primarily to 1936. I think they continue into 1937. Uh, someday when I've completed that research into the next several years, uh, hopefully I'll discover that the arguments apply then as well. 
I draw heavily on a newspaper published by Sylvia Pankhurst, uh, who is in the corner of your screen there. She had been an activist for women's suffrage and was an ardent anti-fascist. This paper you see there, the New Times and Ethiopian News, was established in May 1936, uh, published weekly. And along with the editorials by Pankhurst, the newspaper reported on events in Ethiopia, as well as the wars in Spain and East Asia, along with the general evils of fascism. Of particular importance to my research has been the columns written by Ethiopians, including Dr. Workna Martin, who you'll see here reading a book and in the other picture speaking with the emperor outside the Ethiopian legation building in London, along with two of the emperor's children. Um, it also, so it reported uh, columns, regular columns by Dr. Martin, interviews with exiles, including the emperor, reports of speeches they and other Ethiopians had given, and reports by British groups that had been formed to support the Ethiopian cause. It appears so far, to the best of my knowledge, that few, if any, sources appear to remain that were written by the emperor and other British-based exiles. So this paper provides perhaps one of the best ways to unpack how they asserted the continuing sovereignty of Ethiopia. The emperor and his allies faced three major obstacles to assert their continued recognition, their continued claim to the state of Ethiopia. Now first, Ethiopia had been admitted to the League in 1923, but under what the political scientist Adam Batashu has called burdened membership. Ethiopia had many responsibilities, but few rights. From the very first, some critics charged that the Ethiopian government didn't have the necessary marks of sovereignty and modernity that would allow it to be a full member of the League. Uh, there were accusations that the government permitted the continuance of slavery, that it didn't have a modern capitalist market economy, it didn't have well-defined frontiers. Uh, the League committee that was charged with investigating Ethiopia's worthiness of entry into the League was, quote, unable to determine the extent of the effective control of the central authority over the provinces remote from the capital. And even after it was admitted to the League, there are many in Britain and elsewhere in Europe who made constant refrains about the poor governance and allegations of slave raiding uh, near and across Ethiopia's border. One member of the British Foreign Office in an internal note regarding the two African states in the League, Liberia and Ethiopia, said, the League can never be got to expel any member of the League, however grotesque. The real misfortune is that it even embarked on the disastrous policy of electing these grotesque members. So in going to Europe, appealing to the League of Nations, appealing to the governments of Europe that Ethiopia still existed as an independent state, they were running up against these longstanding accusations that Ethiopia wasn't really modern, that it wasn't really equal to the European states. And Ethiopia had made great use, or Italy had made great use of these accusations and attitudes towards Ethiopia. If Ethiopia couldn't stamp out slavery, if it could not keep internal order, if it was not modern, then maybe guidance by a civilized state was necessary. Britain, France, and the United States and other colonial powers claimed that they had taken up the white man's burden of bringing civilization and modernity to so-called backwards people by force if necessary. So what, Italy asked, was keeping Ethiopia independent if it was not modern? In 1922, Lord Lugard, one of Britain's uh, experts on slavery and on the benefits of colonialism, suggested that instead of membership in the League of Nations, Ethiopia be, Ethiopia be placed under a mandate, which was a kind of pseudo-colonialism in which a white state with League oversight were, was supposed to bring a people closer towards modernity. So while Italy's claim of wanting to civilize Ethiopia was purely rubbish, the cheapest propaganda, it did serve a purpose. There were many in the halls of power in Europe who were willing to accept that Italian colonialism, regardless of why it was undertaken, would prove beneficial to Ethiopians. And Ethiopia also faced the realities of European high politics. 
British officials in Nairobi and in London welcomed Italian rule as they believed that it would be more orderly, that it would fix the alleged incompetence of Ethiopian officials, that the border between Ethiopia and Kenya would finally be demarcated. And so that under the Italians, Ethiopia would start to look like a modern state or at least a properly run colony. Now in doing so, these British officials blithely ignore their own failures in setting up what they would recognize as a modern state in places like Northern Kenya and British Somaliland, which bordered Ethiopia. In these places, British administrative presence was light, contact with Africans irregular. In 1931, one of the district commissioners in Kenya complained that administration must depend on frequent safaris and even then, it's most difficult to keep in touch with populations so scattered that it's possible to travel two or three days together without meeting a soul. They complained that their African subordinates failed to enforce orders, although admittedly their task is not easy. The population is so widely scattered and so hard to get at, a man who does not like an order without leaving the district can get 150 miles or so away from his chief. And so despite their own failures though, to impose what they would recognize as a modern state. The British were bold enough to accuse the emperor of failing to rule his country properly. Sorry, that continues with the, the ideas of white man's burden to turn then to the third point. Um, in the 1930s, Italy and Germany were not, in the mid 1930s, not yet strong allies. And Britain and France especially feared the military, militarization of Germany. And it was supremely important to them to prevent an alliance between the fascist and the Nazi states. Britain was also worried about securing peace in the Mediterranean, which required an alliance with Italy. And so sacrificing Ethiopia to gain Italy's friendship to prevent a feared war in Europe, both governments believed was an easy decision to make. And Ethiopia was after all an African states and few politicians would have sacrificed white lives for black ones. So how then does an emperor and his allies argue that he remained the emperor, that Italy should not be recognized as the ruler of Ethiopia? The first two arguments that they made were practical ones. Uh, first was that there still was an Ethiopian government within Ethiopia. As his armies fell back towards Addis Ababa, and as he left for the UK, the emperor made plans to send his lieutenants west to Bora, which is highlighted there on the map. There, they would establish a government under his childhood friend and trusted counselor, Ras Imru, who was there. There, they would regroup, they would coordinate further military action, and they would keep alive the state on Ethiopian soil. And so throughout 1936, the fall and the winter, there were statements from the Ethiopians in London on their continued contact with the leaders in Gore, that the government in Gore acted like a government, even if under great difficulties, that coffees and hides and other items were being brought forward to sale. And you can see here a note that was sent out of Ethiopia by Ras Imru that arrived with the emperor we have received your majesty's telegram. Having confidence in the league, the imperial government has been accomplishing its duties peacefully and diligently. And indeed, it does have Western Ethiopia under its control. And you'll see another newspaper that was produced in the United States, the Voice of Ethiopia, um, where many of these letters and other uh, uh, notes that had come from Ethiopia were published. So trying to continue to show that Ethiopia did have a government, that the emperor still was in charge of at least part of Ethiopia. And the second related argument was that there was continued fighting in Ethiopia, so that in much of the country, Italian rule barely existed. Um, outside of Addis Ababa, outside of some heavily guarded fortresses, Italians rarely went. Um, there was armed resistance, wide, armed resistance was widespread and it was growing. And you see many of the newspaper articles here that were published either in the Voice of Ethiopia or the New Times in Ethiopian 
news about the number of Ethiopians that were in the field. Um, and you'll see in the bottom right-hand corner, Dateline of Djibouti, the articles written by Ethiopian refugees who were located there and sending along war news. So with these two arguments that there was continued fighting and that a government continued to exist, claims of Italian effective control were put into question. If there is still an Ethiopian government on Ethiopian soil, if the Italians were restricted to a few fortified, fortified positions, then surely Italy could not claim to rule it. And how could Italy claim to civilize Ethiopia if soldiers and officials couldn't move about without fearing for their lives? But by December, however, Italian forces had moved into Western Ethiopia, captured Ras Imru and sent him into prison. Uh, the larger armies were dispersed or defeated over the next several months, some of, some of them taking refuge in Kenya and Somaliland. Now, this isn't to say that resistance ceased. Patriots or Arbenyoc, uh, you see a, a photo there at the time period, uh, patriots who carried out guerrilla warfare. And the other pictures from uh, a couple of years ago in Addis, these are uh, men who had fought against the fascists in the 1930s being celebrated on uh, Patriots Day. So the Italians never did establish effective control over the entire country, but for some of their critics in Europe, guerrilla warfare would never truly be able to dislodge a European power. Lord Halifax, the foreign secretary in 1938, admitted that Ethiopia had still not been fully conquered. But he pointed out this had been the case in many of the British, or many of the European colonies in Africa. The French, he noted, required some 17 years to pacify, the term that was used, to pacify Algeria. But he argued few people indeed would maintain that conditions in Algeria were better before the French colonized it. So Italy surely would pacify and then civilize Ethiopia, this argument went. And so the emperor had to continue with other arguments that he, he admitted, right, that he had fled. He had taken up residence in Britain under the specific agreement with the British government that he would not carry on war efforts from there. And so the assumption in many circles is that having left Addis, the emperor had given up, or at least that meant the end of his rule. The Times of London condemned the Italian invasion and praised the emperor for how he had served his country and the immense responsibilities he had shouldered. Now that those responsibilities no longer in effect exist, the editorial continued, none will blame him for leaving Abyssinia. The implication here is that if the responsibilities of rule and fighting the Italians were gone, surely that meant the responsibilities of ruling his state no longer existed. And Prime Minister Baldwin in June admitted that Italy had broken treaties when it had invaded Ethiopia, but by now the game was up. The Italians have occupied the capital. The emperor of Abyssinia is in flight. There is no government in Abyssinia and the war against which sanctions were invoked is over. That is, it was time to accept Italian rule. So the emperor's allies had to constantly push back against the idea that by re relocating to Europe, the emperor had given up his claim. Dr. Martin noted in the Times that the Times had inserted in one article the phrase, since the abdication of the emperor. As this will give a wrong impression to the public, he wrote to the Times, I shall be much obliged if you will kindly point out in your next issue that the emperor has not abdicated and hopes to return to his country in God's good time. Other critics, including former champions like Wilson Nathaniel Huggins in the United States, Marcus Garvey, uh, now living in London, much reduced from his heyday as a black nationalist leader in the decade before, charged that Haile Selassie had essentially given up his legal or moral claim to the emperor by fleeing. Of this, the emperor and his allies denied he had not fled to spare his own life, they said. He left only on the advice of his advisors, believing that his presence might convince the League at long last to intervene. In an interview late in, 1930, in July 1936, the emperor emphasized the fact that he had left Ethiopia not as a refugee, but in service of his country. 
Martin described the emperor as visiting London. And the emperor had fled not to spare his own life, but to spare his people further suffering. And in fact, he had already risked his life at the front. Sorry, there's some quotes. Uh, and he had risked his life at the front. A picture of the Emperor Manning and anti-aircraft gun at the front was widely reproduced in newspapers, pro-Ethiopian newspapers in the US and London. Uh, in contrast to Mussolini uh, pounding his chest safely to adoring crowds in Rome, the emperor had no fear of death. It wasn't fear of death that took him away from Ethiopia. And far from deserting his people in the time of need, he had left in order to spare his people further suffering. Malako Bayan, uh, who had received his medical degree at Howard University, and he's actually the man uh, not in uh, military uniform in the picture with the emperor, had been at the emperor's side during the war. There, the doctor said, he, had, he, the emperor, was resolved to die and declared he would die on that spot. It was his generals who forcibly carried him away, lest the cause of his country perish with him. And so when they had carried him to Addis Ababa, he was resolved there to hold out till death against the invader. They're pleading, his counselors pleading, that women and children would be, would be slaughtered without mercy and that only by leaving his country could there be hope through diplomatic channels to win the freedom of his people alone persuaded him. It was at the desire and command of his statesmen, not of his own will. Death for his country was his choice. Having chosen to live for her sake, he works now unceasingly to turn defeat into victory. And so he hadn't fled his country, he had not abdicated. In fact, he was continuing the fight. And surely they they pointed out Europeans could not forget their own tradition of hosting exile leaders without doubting that they remained the head of government. So Sylvia Pankhurst pointed out that during the Great War, the functions of the French capital were transferred to Bordeaux. And those of Belgium were transferred partly to Holland, partly to London. And yet no political leader of the day had argued that France and Belgium were conquered. Uh, similarly, journalist and political activist G.T. Garrett pointed out that during World War II, the Belgian government continued to function from outside. After all, but a tiny portion of the country was in effective German occupation. The Allied powers, I believe, held that there was no break in the continuity of government. And so this third argument that the emperor could still rule his country from the United Kingdom, that he had not given up his claim. The fourth argument, now, as I noted above previously, many in the European halls of power were convinced that Ethiopia had no business associating with modern states. It had no business in the League of Nations. It didn't uh, exist on a level of equality with European states. It was backwards. It didn't operate as a modern state should. And these elites, these uh, government officials were all too willing to listen to Italian propaganda that they were on a civilizing mission. Now there's general acknowledgement among many Ethiopian elites that in fact, Ethiopia was not modern. I recall at this time, the 1930s, there were many colonized people who, uh, local patriots, who didn't necessarily question the power of Western industry, of technology, medicine, they might critique how European technology was employed, but few could question that the Maxim gun, the railways, the quinine had helped white people expand their political and economic power across the globe. So for those like those in Ethiopia who wished to preserve their independence or those in the colonial world who wished to assert greater rights, it was believed essential to master your Western ways. So from when he first achieved a major leadership role in Ethiopia in 1916, Haile Selassie insisted that Ethiopia required rapid modernization. Over the 1920s, right up to the outbreak of the war, he undertook a wide variety of political, social, and economic changes that he believed would place Ethiopia on the level of European states, and that that would help secure the African states' independence on an otherwise colonized continent. 
So the extraction of tribute would be replaced by a system of taxes. New roads and a French built railway would ease communication and trade. Uh, a new army would be trained and equipped along European lines. Any existing slave trade would be eliminated and slavery phased out. Young men were sent to Europe and America to be educated and to bring back their skills. Um, not unlike and very consciously modeled on what Japan had been doing for some decades. So Takle Hawaria, uh, who is among this modernizing group, uh, he was the lead representative to the League of Nations. Here you see him in 1935 addressing the League and helped draft a new constitution. This quote is from him in 1931 when introducing the constitution. In our country where the population is not yet sufficiently evolved and has hitherto lived under the rule of ancient law and custom, our emperor has wisely taken the initiative for progress. He thereby greatly raises the status of Ethiopia. The spontaneous evolution of our country is admirable to contemplate. It operates by common accord and in peace and tranquility with the aid and good wishes of all his majesty's servants. Allies also pointed out that Ethiopia had a long glorious history dating back to the pre-Christian era and that Christianity had taken root in their land well before Britain or France had ever heard of Jesus Christ. It was often said that Europeans were still living in caves while civilization was flourishing in Ethiopia. So while Ethiopia might not be up to date with the modern world as it stood in 1935, there was nothing inherent in the Ethiopian people to prevent them from catching up, a phrase that was used. There was nothing racial in their relative backwardness, but rather accidents of history that had cut them off from developments elsewhere. As the, Ethiopia, as the emperor wrote in his autobiography, which he wrote while he was in Britain, our people are desirous to do right. It is our constant wish, and using the royal we there, our constant wish to lead them on the road to civilization and improvement. For though our past history is glorious, it is not to be forgotten that it is only very recently we have begun to follow the path of modern civilization. Even creation itself was not created all at once. And where is the country that has changed all its works within one year? And you see him here both in his royal regalia on his coronation and also during the war outfitted in the Western style military uniform. You see bringing together both their glorious history and modern ways. So they could argue that Ethiopians were not barbarians as Italy claimed. At the same time, admitting that Ethiopia wasn't fully up to date with Western civilization, but that under Haile Selassie, they were well along that path. So in what way did Ethiopia require white rulers? In what way was Italian colonialism necessary? In fact, far from bringing civilization to Ethiopia, Italy was introducing barbarism. This was a powerful argument. Both sides exchanged accusations that the other had committed heinous acts during the war. But as Italian, Italy extended its reach, evidence of Italian murders and abuses piled up. Uh, it had notoriously used uh, mustard gas, which had been outlawed on civilians and soldiers alike. Um, even if people considered Ethiopia pre-modern, surely the Italians were not well placed to bring them civilization. If anything, Italy was dragging Ethiopia backwards. The, Eth the emperor wondered, is it right that the Ethiopian civilization, 25 centuries old, should be destroyed in 25 weeks? with a barbarity that properly, be, properly belongs to the pre-Christian civilizations. And perhaps the worst came in February 1937, uh, Yekatit 12 in Amharic. There was an attempted assassination of the Italian Viceroy Graziani. Um, and in the resulting three days, approximately, or at least 30,000 Ethiopians were slaughtered in the streets. Um, this is a picture, and I've, I've blotted it out here, of Italian soldiers with the decapitated head of an Ethiopian. Uh, this was not uncommon during those, those three days of massacres. So Dr. Martin charged, what a fine Christian method of civilizing the backward Ethiopians. 
in one of his more powerful quotes. We acknowledge our faults and shortcomings, but surely we should not be slaughtered to be civilized. And so again, making the charge that all of these accusations Italy was making about Ethiopian barbarity, that, that Italy had to come and civilize, were being turned around, that in fact, that it was Italy was bringing Ethiopia backwards, Ethiopia that was well on the path towards modernity. The final argument that I want to look at today uh, is a more practical one, that Italian colonization of Ethiopia might harm British colonialism. We see the extent of British colonialism at this point. Britain was the leading imperial state. And even within Britain, those on the left didn't usually criticize empire as such, but rather called for better treatment of the colonized population. The notion that African colonies would begin to gain independence in two decades would have seemed laughable to most Britons. The process of modernizing the colonies, which was part of the rhetoric of empire, would take generations. In the meantime, this thinking went, Africans had to be convinced of Britain's good intentions. In the paternalistic thinking of the time, so long as the childlike Africans trusted the paternal white guides, all would work well. It was imperative to keep out anything, any ideas, any acts that might inject racism or suspicion into the relationship. And of course, ignoring the fact that the entire empire was based on racism. And so recognizing Italian conquest would deeply, perhaps fatally undermine this happy relationship and for those Britons who cared more about power and profit from the empire, rebellions interfered with the extraction of raw materials. It was essential to keep Africans allegedly happy or at least quiet. So the secretary of the London Group on African Affairs said that all of Africa was watching and that Africans could not discern among whites, he said, and would take the worst example, in this case Mussolini, to be representative of all whites, and that the invasion had done more than anything to encourage anti-white sentiment in the colonies. Dr. Martin also pointed out that the colored nations of the world will say, and say it with bitterness and with truth, that European nations are not impartial, but favor each other at the expense of justice to the colored people. And so Britain might claim not to be racist. It might claim to rule the colonies for the benefit of the colonized. It might claim that it had taken up its white man's burden. But allowing a white nation to unjustly conquer a black one would reveal all that to be a lie. This sentiment was shared in a letter to the, to the London Times signed by 18 leading peace activists who wondered what recognition of Italian rule would mean to our imperial work dependent so much upon the respect and loyalty of the African people. And now one of the signatories of this letter was Norman Angel, this gentleman. And it was Angel who a couple of years ago brought me to Ball State University. And I'll admit when I first began researching this topic in Nairobi uh, quite a number of years ago now, I had not considered I would be conducting research at your university. Um, but this is the nature of historical research of our of following the archival trails wherever they go. Um, this is perhaps even more the case when writing the history of refugees who by definition are crossing borders and so leaving archival trails in many different places. So thus far I've had to consult the National Archives in Kenya, Ethiopia, Britain, France, and Italy along with archives in the um, Addis Ababa University, the British Library, the Schomburg Library in the New York Public Library, and many, many unfortunate hours on microfilm. And I want to note here the importance of the internet in contemporary historical research. Uh, I'd simply Googled Friends of Abyssinia, which was one of the uh, groups established in Britain to support Ethiopia and turned up the Norman Angell papers at Ball State. Angell was a friend of Robert La Follette, who was the former chair of the social science department at Ball State for 40 years, apparently 1921 to 1961. 
Uh, they were friends, and he arranged to have Angel receive an honorary degree in 1966, and that's what this other photo is, him in Muncie receiving his honorary degree, and to have his papers donated to Ball State. Now, Angel was born in Britain in 1872, um, left at age 17 for California, where he worked in a variety of jobs, a cow puncher, a mail carrier, a reporter, uh, apparently actually a ditch digger. Uh, he continued his newspaper career when he returned to London and began authoring articles and books on foreign affairs, on peace. He actually won the Nobel Peace Prize, became a leading advocate of the, leading nation, of the League of Nations and a crusader for Ethiopia and other anti-fascist pro-peace causes. So prior to the letter that I just mentioned, Angel had tried to convince Britons that they did in fact have an interest in the rising tensions between Italy and Ethiopia. There's an image of a letter uh, that is in the library, your library, that I looked at a couple of years ago. What is in the British interests? Certain interests are obvious. When Italy crushes the only existing independent African state, and many people claimed at this point that Liberia was not truly independent, but uh, kind of a pseudo colony of the United States and the Firestone Corporation. When European powers have failed to fulfill their obligations to that African state, that clash of color, which is one of the problems of the future, that struggle of all the colored people of the world for liberation from European control and government will have taken on a new bitterness, acquired a new edge. As the power more concerned than any other whatsoever in the governance of non-European colored peoples, Great Britain will be made painfully aware of her interest in the Abyssinia matter. And so Angel and others pointed out, decolonization would one day come. At least in theory, this was part of British imperialism. If Britain poorly treated Ethiopia today, then when the anti-colonial fight took hold, those chickens would come home to roost. And indeed, many Black people living under the British flag were radicalized by the Ethiopian crisis. For but one example, a young man from the Gold Coast named Kwame Nkrumah was passing through Britain on his way to study in the United States when he saw the headline announcing the invasion. At that moment, he later recalled, it was almost as if the whole of London, London had suddenly declared war on me personally. And Nkrumah would later lead the colony of Gold Coast to becoming the new nation of Ghana. To bring this to a conclusion, in the short term, the arguments presented by the emperor, by his fellow exiles and their allies failed. Britain and France were unwilling to go to war for Ethiopia. And in 1938, both finally recognized Italy as the sovereign ruler of Ethiopia. Now, their efforts were not without impact. That Haile Selassie never renounced his crown caused Mussolini great consternation. So long as Haile Selassie remained alive and outside Ethiopia, he inspired other Ethiopian exiles, the patriots inside Ethiopia, and all people who fought against fascism. Mussolini secretly sent him multiple offers of money and of a position as a figurehead back in Ethiopia, all of which offers Haile Selassie refused. Similarly, other refugees elsewhere kept up their insistence that the Italian government in Ethiopia was illegitimate, which worried the Italians to no end. In March 1937, a, um, one of the members of the Italian embassy in London met with the Secretary of State, who then sent a note to the admin British administration in Aden. Uh, and the alleged uh, allegation was that Worknu Gabena, one of the uh, Ethiopian refugees there, made a speech to a crowd of Ethiopian refugees saying that they should resist the Italian conquest of Ethiopia, that the Italian position in that country would be complicated by an imminent European war and so forth. Another Ethiopian at Aden was associated with Miss Sylvia Pankhurst, editor of the New Times and Ethiopian News, sold anti-Italian papers at Aden engaged in anti-Italian propaganda generally and made appeals for funds for this purpose. 
And the Italians made repeated appeals to the British government to prevent this kind of activity, this kind of anti-Italian activity. Now, these efforts to keep up the claim to Ethiopia would take on new importance when Italy entered the war in June 1940. From Ethiopia, the Italians conquered British Somaliland and made a brief foray into the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan, but now it lacks access to supplies that had previously come via the Suez Canal, and Italian East Africa had never become self-sufficient. Taking away Ethiopia would eliminate a threat to the important British colonies of Kenya and Uganda, freeing up troops and provide a desperately needed boost to allied morale. So the man the British government had tried to ignore, the man they had called the ex-emperor, was now an ally. And so he was flown to Sudan to help inspire and organize an invasion of Ethiopia. The soldiers who had taken refuge in Kenya and had been left in a refugee camp were now outfitted for an invasion. Contact was made with the patriots who had been dismissed as mere guerrillas. And in January 1941, the emperor crossed back. This is one of my favorite photos of the emperor. This is him in Sudan with two of the uh, British military advisors who were organizing British troops. And that is, I find, to be one of the best side eyes I have seen ever. On May 5th, five years to the day that Haile Selassie had fled, he re-entered Addis Ababa, claiming, reclaiming his capital, but not reclaiming his sovereignty, for that he had never given up. And I love to end with this photograph. Uh, this is outside the emperor's former palace, which is now a library at the Addis Ababa University. When the Italians arrived, they had made these steps, one for each year since Mussolini had come to power in Italy meant to celebrate fascist rule. Rather than tearing it down, you'll note at the top, the Lion of Judah, the symbol of the emperor, was placed atop it, and it remains there to this day. I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you, Dr. Shadow. Uh, oh, we already have a question in the Q&A. Feel free to submit it that way. Um, so the question to you, Dr. Shadow. Um, first of all, Dr. De Silva says, thank you for such an important and interesting presentation. Can you tell us more about the Ethiopian diaspora at this time and how the two newspapers, New Times and The Voice, were supported and impacted the diaspora? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so there were relatively few Ethiopians abroad in Europe and the United States, other than those who were at this point studying and being sponsored, often sponsored personally by the emperor or by the Ethiopian state. Um, most of them were being supported either by contributions from groups like the uh, Friends of Abyssinia. Um, in the United States, there were two Ethiopians uh, who were very active and produced the voice of um, Ethiopia that was used to uh, garner support primarily among African Americans and among people in the, of the African diaspora in the Caribbean um, that made regular appeals for funds that were then sent back to the emperor in London who spent a great deal of money actually supporting refugees who were in Jerusalem, Sudan, Aden, as we saw. Um, the other who were refugees in British Somaliland and Kenya um, is an interesting story. The British insisted that they remain in refugee camps for fear that they would interfere with colonial rule. Um, and the British made multiple attempts to convince them that it was safe to return to Italy, even though the British knew full well that it wasn't, or return to Ethiopia under Italian rule, even though the British repeatedly admitted in their own files that it was not safe for any of the refugees to return to Italian ruled Ethiopia. So hopefully that kind of answers the question. Thank you. If anyone else would like to either raise their hand virtually or submit the question in the q and I can um, either allow you to talk or ask your question for you.
have a quiet group today. So I have a question that's a bit beyond your actual presentation, but um, I was reading uh, Adi's book on Pan-Africanism and he commented that um, despite the Pan-Africanist community, global community supporting Ethiopia, um, one of the groups that the Emperor Selassie did not appeal to were Pan-Africanists. He made comments upon his arrival that, um, that the Ethiopians were actually not, quote, part of the, quote, Negro peoples. They were um, Hamitic, I forget the out term he used, but I wondered if you could talk to that. Why? I mean, I understand some of the reasons why he would be appealing to Europeans, but um, why did he not appeal more widely and why was he hailed so? Yeah, and this and this actually gets to the the question that Jennifer De Silva asked yeah. in in there also. Um, this was a, a very common accusation made in the twenties and thirties um, across the diaspora that Ethiopians didn't consider themselves black or didn't consider this, themselves Africans, and this has less to do with Ethiopians and more to do with white racial ethnographic and scientific thinking of the previous years. Um, so as many of you may know, um, Europeans, as they began to explore more of ancient Egypt and discover the pyramids and discover that culture, it was very different, difficult for Europeans to admit that there could be a civilization created by Africans, that this important civilization could be made by Africans. So a whole industry grew up of denying that ancient Egypt was in any way related to Africa, that these had to have been white people in some way. And so similar, as they learn more about ancient Ethiopia, similar arguments were made by white travelers, by white ethnographers, that Ethiopia wasn't really white. And this wasn't, to the best of my knowledge, was not one that was pursued by Haile Selassie, not pursued by other Ethiopian elites, but it was very common accusation made. And this then, um, discussing African Americans, was one that circulated at times among opponents of the emperor, among opponents of Ethiopia, that why should you give money to the emperor if he doesn't even consider himself black, right? Why should we support him if he looks down on us? So one of the important things that the emperor did was send, I would mentioned uh, Malak Obayan, who was a doctor trained at, at Howard University. He was sent by the emperor in the 1920s to uh, become educated in the US. And he very specifically associated himself primarily with African-Americans. He intentionally went to Howard so that he could be what he said among his people. Um, he married an African-American woman from Evanston, just up around the corner from y'all, um, and then went back and served with the emperor during the war and fled with him to the UK. The emperor sent him to the US and based, he was based, based himself in Harlem very specifically to reach out to African Americans and Africans in the diaspora um, and consistently said, we are black men, we are all black people and built an organization, the Ethiopian World Federation and then the newspaper Voice of Ethiopia that was very, very specifically Pan-Africanist and black nationalist. Mm -hmm. um, he did very little outreach to white groups, spoke primarily at uh, the, um, prim the main AME and Baptist churches in Harlem, toured all over um, and raised money that way. And the newspaper really spoke about a partnership between Ethiopia as the homeland of all black people. Uh, they claimed that Amharic was the ancestor of all African languages, which isn't true, but it making the point that, that if you give us our, your support, help us free our country, this is also your country. And you can come and actually invited people to come and live in Ethiopia after the war, um, where they could be free, where they could be black people and not live under white supremacy. And someday, hopefully within the next year or two, I have an article just on that very topic that uh, 
uh, okay. hopefully speaks to some of those those questions. Okay, we did have another question from Dr. Jim Connolly. He's interested in hearing more about the ways these refugees thought about their audiences, other Euro Ethiopians versus European leaders, and how much they tailored their arguments for each or both. Yes, and that's, I think, absolutely the case that in many of the articles that were published in these newspapers, um, they were primarily directed to um, other European, to Europeans, to mm -hmm. the British public and hoping that the British public would then influence their MPs, influence the government. Um, so there's, I think, it, I think the distinction then there is between what they were presenting to the British public. And many of these arguments are ones that they surely believe, you know, saying that the emperor had not abdicated. That was critical for them to make that point, uh, both to themselves, but then also to make sure that that message was received by the patriots within Ethiopia. So there was communication that um, I haven't looked at yet, but there are some letters still in the um, archive in Addis of letters that were going between the patriots who were in Ethiopia and the emperor and the emperor's representative. So he's making a similar kind of argument to them that I'm still your emperor. I didn't abdicate, I didn't leave you behind um, and I'm coming back. The really interesting distinction is what's being printed in the voice of Ethiopia in the United States, which was not directed towards white readers whatsoever, it was not directed towards the broader American public. And copies of that were smuggled um, into camps apparently in Kenya and Aden. They're in regular contact with refugees in Aden and Djibouti. So that there was kind of a, an alternate discourse around black nationalism that was circulating, I think, especially amongst the diaspora but also with um, people, uh, refugees who were in the camps and uh, just outside Ethiopia. Thank you. We still have time for a question or two more. Anyone else from the audience? Um, you did mention that there were specific methodologies distinct to researching refugees, and that was part of what has brought you to so many very different archives. I was hoping you could speak for at least a few minutes on the um, distinct methodologies and distinct challenges of researching refugees. Um, it is. So in my previous work, um, and as you know, doing African history in the colonial period, uh, you often end up doing research in at least two countries, meaning in Africa and in Europe, depending on the former colonial power. So for previous research, I definitely did a great deal of research in Kenya, but also a great deal of research in Britain, looking at old colonial files, government records there. Um, but one of the issues that I found is that when Ethiopians fled, they didn't flee to one country. Um, there were about 8,000 who went to Kenya. There were another one to 2,000 who went to British Somaliland. There were others in Sudan, Jerusalem, Aden, Egypt, the UK, and then the United States. Um, so one of the challenges is really casting a much wider net than normal and having to, part of the challenge for me then is to understand I feel very comfortable with understanding the colonial context in Kenya in the 1930s. Um, I'm having to familiarize myself more with the political context in Britain in the 1930s and in British Somaliland. And uh, just the research I'd just done reading up more on black nationalism and pan-Africanism in the diaspora. So part of the challenge also, and you're looking at government archives, trying to find private archives, um, the various uh, NGOs, private groups that were formed, newspapers that were formed. The other challenge that I'm finding is, is trying to dis decide how to organize the book mm. because it's a relatively short time frame. Um, the emperor was really one of the first exiles left in 1936. He returned in 1941. Most of the refugees were back within a year, 1942. Mm -hmm. 
So really, I'm only looking at a six year period, but I'm discussing events going on in Harlem and in London and Geneva and Jerusalem and Kenya. And they operate along different patterns and different timelines. And what's going on in a refugee camp in dusty part of Northern Kenya is very different from what's going on in Harlem. So it's very difficult to do a, a, a chronological book because there are many people doing many different things in different places, but all at the same time. Um, so that's been actually a, a significant challenge. Okay, well, thank you all for your attendance. If anyone has questions that they would like to ask Dr. Shadow one-on-one, -on -one, um, I believe he can stick around for a few more minutes. Um, so just uh, raise your hand and I can allow you to talk. Um, but I look forward to seeing some of you in this afternoon's panels and thank you, Dr. Shaddle, for showing us a different view of what is leading up to World War II. Thank you.